name, I will be there. And he's here today in a very special way because he promised that he would be. Hallelujah. I want you to turn with me this morning to the book of Revelation. And I'm going to be reading from the third chapter. Now, many of you would know before I even speak uh, about the book of Revelation that chapters 2 and 3 are letters that Jesus dictated to John. He told John to write these letters to seven churches in Asia Minor. Now, if you are familiar with the map of Asia Minor, you would recognize that these seven, these seven cities and the seven churches are in a circle. And Jesus started at one point and went clockwise around that circle until he comes to this final one here. And uh, so I'm just kind of curious before I get into the message this morning, how many are you how many of you are familiar with the church of Laodicea? Does that sound familiar to you? And um, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you this. Um, though I'm I've never been completely persuaded about this. Um because I know that these seven churches existed at the time that Jesus dictated these letters to John. These churches existed. All of those churches still have um, a remnant that remains. You can, in other words, you can go to six of these seven churches to which these letters were written in there is a fragment or a remnant that remains from them, all except one. One's not there. And uh, Jesus warned that one church, said, if you don't hear my voice, I'm going to remove you. And apparently they didn't because he did remove them and they're not there. But the other six are there. And so this was a, this was a historical fact. However, great teachers of prophecy greater than I would ever hope to be. Have, many of them have seen a correlation between these seven churches and seven distinct periods of church history. I'm not persuaded that that's honestly true. I'm, I'm not saying this to confuse you today, but I'm just saying I'm not positive that that's really a thing. But if it is a thing, because what, let me say this, everything that Jesus said to the other six churches besides Laodicea, it still applies to us today. It's still the truth, just like when you read the letters to, to Corinth, for example, Corinthians, 1st, 2nd Corinthians. Those apply to us. And so do the seven churches, the letters that Jesus dictated. Those letters apply to the whole church. That's, it's, it's inspired. It's God-breathed. It applies to, to all the church of all history. But if this theory that is propagated, taught by many great teachers, is true, then today our church, not not this church, but the church uh, around the world, the Ch Delana calls it the capital C church, uh, that church corresponds with the church of Laodicea, the church that leads right up into the second coming of the Lord. Well, whether that's the case or not, it, that, that very well may be, in other words, that especially these words that I'm going to read to you today, Jesus dictating them to the church of Laodicea, may have a very special meaning to us today. Special. Uh, more so than other generations. 
But uh, um, certainly it is true that the eternal truth, the God-breathed truth of this portion applies to us and to all Christians. So in chapter 3 of the book of Revelation, beginning with verse number 14, Jesus says to John, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things say the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To he who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Heavenly Father, I ask in Jesus' name that you would give us divine insight into your message today that you have uh, laid on our heart. I pray that our ears will be open, we'll have ears to hear, and a heart to perceive what the Spirit's saying to the church today, and I give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I want to say one thing further about this whole message, that is, the whole dictating of seven letters to these seven churches. And in each one of these uh, cities where the churches sat, these letters, each one, contain reflections that are literally true about that historical site. And so when we get to the church of Laodicea, and it begins by saying, uh, you're neither hot nor cold, the church of Laodicea was a church that was noted for its springs. In other words, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Thermopolis, uh, Wyoming. These places that people go to for natural heated springs, mineral springs, these springs were present and are present still in Laodicea that people in that part of the world will go uh, be a vacation, go to the spa and lay out by the hot springs. There are also in Laodicea cold springs. Not all the springs are uh, heated by the core of the earth as are those heated springs. Many of them are the result of mountain snows that have melted and the result are that they are very cold water. There is brackish water backing from the sea up into the, tribu uh, the um, uh, streams that flow in the ocean, uh, also in Laodicea. And these waters are not influenced by the hot springs, nor are they influenced by the melting snow. Instead, these waters tend to be stale, stagnant. My grandma, I was raised literally on the banks of Lost Creek. Get in your map sometime. In fact, is in the state of Missouri, Lost Creek is a state uh, park. And I was raised actually 
actually, I was raised on Little Lost Creek, which, of course, runs into Lost Creek. I was just small spring. And um, generally, that creek was, uh, it, ran all, it ran all year. There were times in the spring when it, if we got into flood trouble, it was because of Little Lost Creek. Um, but generally, it ran all year. There were a few occasions when drought caused Little Lost Creek to completely dry up, where it didn't run at all. You'd find maybe a few pools if you walked up and down those banks, but it would get dry enough that the water did not above the surface run. I never knew Lost Creek to get that dry, but this little tributary where it ran by my grandparents' house, Little Lost Creek, did get that dry. Regardless of that, my grandmother, now I don't know where she got this wisdom, but I've learned since that it was absol- it's absolutely scientific. But she had a rule about the second week in August in Little Lost Creek. You, I wasn't allowed to go swimming in Little Lost Creek after the second week in August. Well, it was still plenty hot. You, you still would like to find a place to get cooled off if you were a boy growing up in a creek bank. But I was not allowed to get in that water because the stream had slowed down, the water temperature had been elevated. Grandma didn't know all of this, I suppose. Maybe she did, but that it gave uh, a... a uh, habitat for bacteria and blue-green algae to grow, and it can make you sick. She didn't didn't say anything about the algae. She didn't say anything about the bacteria. She just said, you can't swim after you get to the dog days of summer. Now, I don't know where she heard that. I've I've heard people talk about dog days, but no one ever attributed it to a date besides my grandmother, at least to me, that I knew about. But I kept what she said, took it to heart. I could see there was a difference in the water. It wasn't flowing as swift. There was a smaller stream. Water was moving slow or not at all. Some pools, and you could see the stagnation showing up across the surface of the water, it held uh, disease. It would make, it could, it could make you sick. It could make you, it, this doesn't sound very nice to say to a congregation on a Sunday morning, but it could make you vomit. That lukewarm, stagnant water. Now, I was a lot, this is pretty a long introduction, so I'll try to move along quicker from here in and say to you, I know you've heard messages preached, and I am not taking a position against them. I'm just saying that I think that that they do present a biblical truth. When people have talked about hot, meaning you're on fire for God, and cold, meaning that you maybe your relationship with God has gotten weak. I never, and and people will tell you, so you ought to get hot, you know, talking about preaching this message on lukewarm. You need to get hot. But Jesus said in this text, did you follow me? He said, I'd rather you be hot or cold, just not lukewarm. I couldn't understand why Jesus would rather me be cold. I finally made up something like, well, if you're cold, then you know you're away from God. If you're lukewarm, you don't Okay, I can kind of see that. And it kind of be, people kind of preach that, but I, now I'm going to tell you the honest truth. I don't believe that's what Jesus had in mind. When he spoke to John and said, I want you to write this letter to these people that live in the middle of these hot springs and these cold springs. I don't think that's what Jesus was talking about. Hot being on fire for God, cold being cold and indifferent in their relationship with God. I don't think he meant that at all. What he meant was we have a tendency to moderate 
When we, if, if you take a glass of water and set it out on the counter, it doesn't just keep getting hotter and hotter and hotter. It'll, if you've had it in the refrigerator and take it out, pretty soon it gets where it's not refrigerated anymore. When you get it out of the tap, usually it's colder than it will be after you set it out a little while because why? It moderates to room temperature. You pour out a cup of coffee and you forget that it's there. How many know what I'm talking about? And, and you go back to get it and it's set there for 30 minutes and now it's, it's cold. Now that's all right with Delena. She just put ice in it and it's perfect. N not for me. There's only one way to drink coffee and you don't get it out of the refrigeration center at the convenience store. It's hot is the way to drink coffee. And I'm taught for, you know, for me. But, but um, what I'm telling you is if you get that cup of coffee, actually when you taste it, and you're, if you're like me, oh, it, it feels ice cold. But really it's not ice cold. It has just reduced itself to room temperature. See, room temperature really feels cold because your mouth is about 98 degrees and room temperature is about 70. It's almost 30 degrees cooler. So that feels cold, see. But it, it doesn't just keep getting cold. It gets room temperature. It gets lukewarm, all right? All right. So what Jesus is saying here is, I don't want you to migrate to room temperature. People around you are room temperature. One of the problems that church has is trying to be acceptable in the world so they don't think we're all kooks and they all might want to come and be a Christian with us. But if all they're trying to do is become lukewarm, then that doesn't do us any good. I said, we don't need people to get lukewarm. They are already lukewarm. Unsaved, unregenerated, unrefined by the Holy Spirit, unaffected by the power of the Word of God, they're already lukewarm. And they don't need to get lukewarm. You don't need to lead somebody to lukewarm. What they need is a witness. What they need is a jolt. What they need is a taste of reality. These lukewarm, unregenerate, lost people. What they need is hot, boiling hot. Or they need cold. They need something that will shock their senses. Something to make them realize that the life that they are living is not the heavenly calling. And they don't need churches to law them to comfort in lukewarmness. And Jesus said that lukewarmness makes me sick. Sick. Yeah. So now this, this might be a letter to us. Remember what I said? Might have been talking about the people that lived in the 2020 decade. Maybe the last days leading up to the return of Jesus. He may have been talking about the American church that lived in the generation that became so enlightened that we didn't know any longer that there are two genders. But there might be 20 or more. The foolishness of that, I don't even need to go into, but the church. You know, we do have a task here. We love those people. We want to see God do a work in their life. We want to see them redeemed and delivered. We, we, we love them as much as we love anybody. 
But we're still not blind. We still know what a male looks like and a female looks like. <laughs> and they can feel any way they want to feel. But they are how God made them and that's what they are. Hot and cold. We can be lukewarm so we don't offend anybody here, but we're not going to see anybody converted if we stay lukewarm. See? Yeah. So, Jesus said, I'd rather you be hot or cold. And here was the problem. The church said they are rich, increased with goods, and in need of nothing. I, years ago, I was at a. We, we used to take prayer requests every service, and um, I was at a church holding a revival meeting at a church that uh, typically took prayer, accepted prayer requests. I was in a revival, it means I'm in serve Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday morning, starting again the second week around. And every service, the pastor got up to take prayer requests at one part of the service. And after we'd be gone for a while, I guess about everybody had a prayer request and kind of told what they wanted us to pray about, you know. And so he got up and said, has there anybody got a prayer request? And he stood there for a few uncomfortable moments and no one said anything, no prayer requests. He said, well, I guess we're increased with goods and in need of nothing. And, of course, he was, he was referring to the scripture and he was uh, being, uh, just being lighthearted about it. But, but um, uh, this is a problem with people who come to the place in their walk with the Lord that they really do not depend on the Lord for anything. I, I, I don't want to get into the message today. I'm going to talk about prosperity and the blessings of God, I believe in that. I believe that God blesses, takes care of us, and increases us. I believe in all that. It's a message for another day. But I want to tell you this, it's a mistake for a person to ever get to the place, regardless of what level he is into in experiencing blessing and prosperity, to get to the place where he says, you know, I've got this. Yeah. Me and... and uh, Edward Jones down here, we got our plan and everything's everything's set up. No. No, no. I I, I understand the idea of a of a nest egg and getting a retirement plan. And I and I can see, I can identify with people that say, Whew, I hit that marker, I made that goal, and got, you know, I, I appreciate that. I understand that. But never do we get to the place where we say, now. God's blessed me enough, and, he's, and, and I don't need God to oversee my finances anymore. We never get to that place, not, not only our finances. How many things, you know, a person gets all of his finances in order, and then he finds himself uh, diagnosed with an incurable condition. So now tell me how much all those finances will help you. I, I'm making the point here that Jesus had a, had a reason for teaching us to pray Give us today our daily bread. If the bank account is on the marker or not, if we got what we need, we feel like we've, or not, that we depend on him. Give us today our daily bread. And so this church of Laodicea had the problem of be, they were rich and increased with goods and had need of nothing. So Jesus said, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you some advice. You think you're wealthy, but you, and you don't know that you're miserable. So I'm going to counsel that you buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. And so here what we are understanding is the concept of true riches. Get, get gold from me, Jesus says, that has been refined by the fire and white garments. So he's talking about the church needing God to do a work in their life, a, a work of giving them true riches, a work of sanctifying them, putting on a white robe. Everybody sings that song, I'm going to wear a robe 
uh, and a crown. We get to heaven, my feet touch glory. I'm going to put on, a, put on the garment now. I said, let God put the garment on you now. Let him separate you from the world now. And, and I'm not talking, you know, a lot of people, holiness is all on their clothesline. I'm talking about real holiness. I'm talking about where, you know, when people are trying to get holy, making themselves holy, they fail at it. You cannot make yourself holy. But when the Lord brings holiness, those garments, it causes us to love one another. It helps us to forgive one another. It puts us in the midst of the work of God. We become God, uh, God's representative extended to this generation when God puts his holiness in our life. So Jesus said, so you need real wealth, you need white garments, and you need eye salve that you might be able to see. Folks, if there ever has been a time that we need to be circumspect, that's a great word. One of these days, look it up. It'll, it'll bless you. We need to be circumspect. We need to understand the days we're living in. We need to understand what it means to be led by the Spirit of God in days of darkness. That our eyes would be anointed with eyes to have that we might say we need to have God to give us vision. Now Jesus then says loving words because it, it sounds a little cross. In fact, I'm sure that some of the things I've said this morning might sound like I'm a little cross. And I, and I don't mean, I'm not mad, but I'm serious. And so Jesus says to the church now so that they'll understand... As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. I'm not saying this to you because I'm mad. I'm telling you because I love you. Jesus is saying to this church at Laodicea, I've got a love thing for you, and I love you enough to tell you the truth. Lord, help us. Give us that boldness to love people enough to tell them the truth. And so now, keep in mind, this letter is being written not to the city of Laodicea, but to the church of Laodicea. I want to just get that clear in your mind because this next thing may be a little mind-blowing to you. This, Jesus is dictating this letter to the church in Laodicea, not to the city. It didn't go to the city council. It went to the church. And he says something that's kind of surprising to me. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And I say, why? The church? Why is Jesus knocking on the door of the church? Why is Jesus on the outside? And the church is meeting on the inside. And why is he saying, while the meeting is going on, I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. Don't you love the story? of when the apostle Peter had been arrested by King Agrippa, locked in prison, and he's got a guard on each side of him, and he's in chains. Well, what would you do if that was your pastor? I'm kind of curious about that, what you would do if that was your pastor. But the church said, we're going to pray all night until God sets our pastor free. And they did. You know, they met over at a lady's name, a, a ma lady's house whose name was Mary. And they had a big prayer meeting there. And as they prayed, an angel smote, said, I don't know how hard you have to hit somebody to smite them. 
But the Bible said that, that the angel smote, Peter woke him up. And his shackles fell off his hand and his feet. The guards were still asleep. Angel says, get your coat, come on. So Peter gets up, puts on his cloak, and they walked. Peter thinks he's sleeping. I'm, the Bible says Peter thought he was asleep. And so he comes to the gate, and the gate just opens up of its own accord. And the next thing Peter knows, he's out on the street, and the angel's going another way. He said, hey, I'm awake. This is, he pinches himself, I'm awake. I've... I imagine that the church is over at Mary's house praying for me right now. I, he just got that idea. And he went over to Mary's house, and sure enough, it was lit up, and if he listened, he could hear in the door people inside, and they're praying. And so what does he do? He knocks. And they're so busy praying that there's one little damsel Somebody look up what damsel means. I know it's a girl, and I don't know how old she is, but a, a damsel came to the door and said, Who is it? And he said, It's Peter. And she said, Who? Peter. This is Peter. Let me in. And she don't believe it at first. And then all of a sudden she believes it, I guess. And so she runs in where the people are praying. And she said, everybody, it's Peter. He's at the door. And they said, no, Rhoda, just calm down. We're still praying about this. I don't know. And, at the, you know, they, they're talking. As, and as they're talking it over, Peter has to knock again. And finally, they come and open the door, and sure enough, it's Peter. Well, anyway, I get this little, you know, the church is meeting, and Jesus is knocking. And somebody might run to the door and say, who is it? Jesus says, it's Jesus. And they might run back in, and they talk it over. They might have a meeting. They might want to have a vote on whatever. But in the meantime, Jesus is still on the outside of the church, and he's still knocking. And they're doing whatever they're doing. <laughs> they might be planning their next Halloween theme party. I don't know what they're doing in there. But whatever they're doing, Jesus is knocking and they're still doing it. And um, so, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, anyone, who are you waiting on to open the door? If anybody will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me if somebody will just open this door. And I'm telling you today that we need to take it to heart. We need to get the door open. We, we don't need to have any more church activities without Jesus in it. But we need to open the door. We need to get him in. We need to get fellowship with him. We need to become a separated people, hot or cold, but certainly never, ever, ever lukewarm. We should not look like the world. We should not talk like the world. We don't need to act like the world. We need to act like the fountain that comes from the source. We need to be fiery hot. We need to be, we need to be icy cold. We need to be separated and different and distinct from this world. And until we do that, we will never make an impact, never make an impact on this generation. We cannot be room temperature and make a difference. It's time to step up. Let's bow our heads. Lord, thank you.
for the word today. I thank you that you spoke to the church at Laodicea. And I pray that you would speak to the church at Big Speeds this morning. Speak to our hearts. Help us to see that what you have planned for us is so much more than what we have walked in up until now. Lord, we desire of you true riches, true wealth, gold that's been tried in the fire. We desire to be walking even now in distinguished robes that's been made pure and white. And Lord, we ask that the Holy Spirit anoint our spiritual eyes with eye salve that we might know, that we might perceive the truth around us. Lord, give us eyes to see and hearts to understand. Jesus, we want to be witnesses unto you in this generation. And I praise you for the opportunity of living in this day. And I thank you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit that gives us victory. For Jesus' sake, amen and amen. Well, I, I, um, I, I mentioned this last week. We've, I had a couple of uh, funerals to deal with, and one of them in particular, I said, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. I said, I've been preaching on the coming of the Lord Jesus now for over 50 years. That's a literal statement. Over 50 years, I've been telling people, Jesus is coming. He's right at the door. I I've been telling folks, it's like Gabriel already putting the trumpet to his lips. You, ever, you hear these things before? I have said so many things about the coming of the Lord, I've ran out of things to say. I've been talking about this for 50 years. And now, I mean, I, I, I know what I, what I know is Jesus is coming. What I don't know is exactly when. I know that he is coming fast and quick, and so I know that it challenges us to be ready every day. And if there's somebody that we're wanting to talk to about things, our relationship between one another or, you know, their, their walk with God, if there was somebody that we felt like we wanted to talk to, we better get her done because we don't know. What I, what I was saying was I really thought 50 years ago, you, you ought to see my sermon notes. I mean, I was extreme. Was I always accurate? Well, obviously, it's been 50 more years. If my sermons had been right, the Lord would have come 49 years ago. But this has been... But what I'm, what I'm telling you, I, th I think... This is Church of Laodicea. I think if our eyes are open a little bit, that we know things are different now than they were 50 years ago. Than they were 10 years ago. And, um, you know, I, I said a few days ago, in, with, with what we're faced with in our generation, the only thing left to do is to lift up your head. We're there. I mean, that, that these days that are so uncomfortable to us are the days that had to happen. We're looking forward to it. These are the days of promise. That being said, let me tell you what has really um, con concerned me. As during the two, almost two years now, soon be two years that we've seen this worldwide pandemic, is I've watched the church regress in terms of evangelism. I don't mean that people become worldly are sinful or sensuous or any of that. I don't, the church, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is what really has concerned, it's obvious to me that we, that the work of evangelism has suffered 
in the last couple of years really bad. And what I'm going to tell you is the only thing that can change that is we've got to have help. We've got to have help from the Holy Spirit at a level we have never experienced before. I mean, we've seen great moves of God, haven't we? I mean, we've seen God do some things. And we have sensed Him baptizing us, infusing us with power. We can't deny that. But we need more than we've ever had in this day of darkness to end this program the way God intends for us to end it. And so I want you, to, if, if you pay attention, I believe that you will notice that there is a Gentile call from Jesus that, are, that is saying to us today, if you will hear my voice, and open the door to me. I'm going to come into you and I'm going to be closer to you than I have ever been with you before. I believe that is an opportunity that goes with this day of darkness. When iniquity abounds, the grace of God much more abounds. I'll admit to you we've faced some stuff we've never faced before. And I am challenged by it because God will not let us down. And he's, with the trouble that's coming, God's sending help. I said, you've got help on the way. And if you will hear his voice today, because he's calling, and you'll open the door, he says, I'm going to come into you and, and I'm going to be closer to you than we've ever been before. And so I'm going to do, I want us to end this service this way. I don't know what Linda's got ready here. She's always ready. I'm going to ask, every, in just a minute, I'm going to ask everybody to stand. And I want us to take this call of Jesus literal and personal. Jesus calling you today. He's knocking. And, and you can either, you could stay in your seat or you could stand to your feet and go through the motions and not mean a thing by it. If you want to, no one's going to know but what you do. But if you, if he said if anyone, I'm knocking, if anyone will hear my voice and will open the door, I will come into him. I, I'm telling you that God's wanting to do more inside you today, right now, than you've ever experienced before. He's going to make you hot. He's going to make you cold. He's going to make you anything but lukewarm. He's going to make you a difference maker in this generation. And so I'm going to invite everybody to stand. Linda's going to play something and sing and lead us in worship. And you can worship with her if you want. But I want you, as you're standing here today, to tune your ears in to Jesus. He's knocking. And I want you to say, Lord, I'm opening the door. And I want you to come in. I want you to eat with me. And I want to eat you. I want to get closer to you than I've ever been. I want more of you in my life than I've ever had. You cry out to him from your heart with your own words. Let's look to heaven right now. Would you join me? Let's do it. Lord, we're listening. We believe that's you. We believe that you're standing at the door and you're knocking, you're knocking. And we're saying, please, Lord, we open the door and we say, come in, come in, come in. Come in, Lord. We want to be closer to you today than we've ever been. We want your touch like we've never felt it. We want to have a relationship and a fellowship with you that's more significant than we've ever had. Oh, Lord, we want to know what it means to possess true riches that's been tried in the fire. Lord, we want you to clothe us with robes of white in the earth. Lord, we want you to give us eyes to see, heart to perceive. Lord God, give us eyes, give us vision. I'm asking in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, Father, do a work inside us now. 
These are days that are trying us like we've never been tried. Lord, we believe in you to help us to come along beside us. Holy Spirit, to lead us in this day. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Oh, Lord. Lord, we open the door. Come in us. Come into us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, this is a day of darkness, but you're the light. Hallelujah. Bless you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Oh, we bless you, Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> we give you glory. Amen. More of you sing the song today. More of you, more of you is what I long for. <laughs> it's what I need. More of you is what I need. Oh, more of you, more of you is what. Lord Jesus.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Santa la casita, Santa la cara. Thank you for joining us for Sunday morning worship service. We pray that God moved in your life, ministered to you, and spoke strongly to your hearts this morning. We would love to pray with you, talk with you. If you would like to connect with us, someone is waiting by the phone right now to talk with you at 918-366-8436. And you can always connect with us online at BixbyFirst.com and on Facebook at Bixby First Assembly. God bless you.